imagine you're sat at home. I'm, I'm watching a film about Japan. I get very excited about the possibility of going there. By the time the film ends, the AI has created a little 60 second travelogue of what I might see if I went to Japan. I share it with friends via my AI, see who wants to come with me. The AI then takes everyone's requirements. All the suppliers come back and bid for what experience they can create. The AI then negotiates the best price for the best deal. Come to the day of travel, I don't need any luggage because I'm gonna have it all 3D printed for me waiting on arrival. Uh, the car picks me up, it's an autonomous vehicle in the car. All the security checks, all the scans, everything is done. On the flight, the AI is negotiating with the airline to make sure I only get the food and, and drink that's good for me. During that, I might also want to have downloaded to my memory the Japanese language so I can talk to people when I get there. Okay, welcome back to Futurist World. I'm Mike Hill, and Futurist World is your home for big ideas of tomorrow. Today, we have a great new episode about the future of travel featuring two very special guests. We're seeing a return to the show by Dr. Rob Grenfell, Director of Health and Biosecurity at CSIRO Australia, Australia's leading science research organization. Rob focuses on health, biosecurity, genomics, personalized health and well-being. He also specializes in forging partnerships between government, industry and the wider medical community for the benefit of all. And joining us from London is Rohit Talwa, CEO of Fast Future, a research and insights business that helps individuals and businesses create better futures. Uh, Rohit recently published Aftershocks and Opportunities, Scenarios for a Post-Pandemic Future in June this year, which draws on contributions from 25 thought leaders around the world and comments on how we will navigate our way out of the COVID-19 health crisis. Rohit, great to have you on the show as a futurist. Maybe you could kick us off. Planes have been grounded during the pandemic right around the world. What does the future of travel look like from now on? Well, hello there. Uh, I guess it's quite a big topic to to say what does the future of travel look like because it's such a broad uh, sector and it's I think it's the biggest sector in the world at the moment, or was till the start of this year. Um, I think there's a few things going to happen and I, I think you have to break it down into five-year chunks uh, and really the next five years are about industry recovery. I would say that it's looking like the aircraft industry or the air, air transport industry won't really get back to anything like its new normal until 2024, 2025. And that might only be about 80% of what it was doing in 2019. And there's a question now as to whether it will ever get back to the volumes uh, and revenues it was seeing in 2019 in real terms, simply because of the kind of shifts that are going on, whether it's environmental pressures, businesses getting used to doing meetings online, having more virtual conferences. There's a real question as to whether we'll, we'll see the rise in business travel to the same level. We'll certainly see consumer travel, I think, pick back up over time. I think the, the other big thing in that five-year period is that uh, we're going to see more and more technology coming into the experience with AI helping us design and book experiences more and more technology in the cabin to personalize our experience. And then when we get to our hotel, everything from checking in with your face to having digital wallpaper in the walls. And when you open your mini bar, your AI has been at it, talking to the hotel. So gone are the, the Toblerones, the whiskies and the cans of beer. And they've been replaced by, you know, carrot bars and alfalfa juice. Oh, that sounds terrible, right? Personalized to our physiology as well. Jeez, that's a dystopian fridge you've described there. But you've given us some great ideas. Rob, I want to ask you about health and travel. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to 9-11 and how that totally changed the way that we travel. And it feels like this is another huge disruption and things will never be the same again. How do you see it rolling out from here on in? Well, look, uh, when the pandemic started, it's interesting that uh, my organisation's had a long enduring relationship with Boeing. And uh, they were first out of the starting blocks to arrange some of the best strategic meetings that I th think I've actually ever been to. So um, I was getting up at uh, ungodly hours in the morning um, to sit through some of the most stimulating 
uh, strategic meetings on what's going to happen to the aviation industry. So Boeing's got a lot at stake here. Um, and, you know, we're now nine months down. And what have they discovered? That uh, actually on the plane is safe. But it's all of the stuff that getting to the airport, getting through the airport, getting off the plane and all those things, which are actually the exposure issues. How is um, it safe on the plane? Like, and it just seemed like fake news when all that came out. It was so hard to believe that you could get COVID everywhere except on the plane. How does it work? Well, well we, we've known that most respiratory infections are really only a risk to you in the actual seats around you. And so someone who's actually spreading it actively just around them. Because the air changes about 40 times. Um, per hour uh, or so, and it's a, an art uh, flow down and goes through the feet. So it's in fact not like sitting in an office, which of course is actually a high risk activity. So the um, the issue on the plane is fine, but you know how many times have we stood in queues that we've actually suffered through? Uh, I just sort of think I've been speaking with airline uh, groups who are trying to look at how they can uh, improve the uh, passage of people in a safe way through there. So. These are mechanical issues that need to be solved as we know more and more about the behaviour of this virus. But then it comes to the hotel experience, the rental car experience, all the additional cleaning that needs to happen because this virus persists in the environment. This virus, unfortunately, is very hardy and um, it's, it's going to be one of those challenges. And so one of the things that came out of talking with some of the airlines, the, AV, um, the airport authorities and also uh, manufacturers like Boeing has been confidence. And I think Rohit hit the nail on the head. Do I want to travel? Now, I, I'm, I'm platinum on two airlines, which is obscene um, in these areas of, um, of, of, of uh, climate change and other and climate impacts. Huge footprint. And, yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I'm actually reveling in the fact that I have, uh, my last trip was January this year. So, you know, nearly 12 months ago now. <laughs> and I have been able to do international conferences, meetings and everything else from my uh, country retreat. Uh, do I want to travel again? And I think, again, the issue is how do we coax business travellers back to what was a lucrative market? The second is uh, we look at the bottom line of our agency. We were expending a significant amount on travel. Uh, we're not now. Uh, we can use that on actual work and science rather than, in fact, those, um, uh, those incidentals that we had with travel. But I reflect on the personal thing of travelling. What we're seeing is people are now tentatively starting to travel domestically and some of the markets that have recovered um, in some countries, such as, say, China, for instance, where they have rebounded quite well. Um, we're still just seeing really land-based travel coming back in Australia's perspective. Uh, I watched a travel show last night on TV where uh, one of our celebrity chefs was in Vietnam and I'm going, oh, I would love to be back there. Um, so I think in the, the thing for us is actually what are we, uh, what, what's going to draw us? I, I, I too agree that uh, tourism will bring us back. But business, I reckon we've made that big step, Mike. We're not actually going to be uh, doing business the way we used to because everybody now can and is getting more confident with this type of format. Yeah, that's great, Rob, and I'll come back to that in a sec, but let's stay at the airport just for a moment longer. So I had my, I know it's different in the UK, Rohit, but I had my first, you know, pretty much all planes were grounded here in Australia, and I had my first trip a few days ago up to Sydney from Melbourne, and it was amazing because there were no people around, everything moved, everything was automated. Um, how do you see this working now, the airport experience that Rob was talking about, eliminating those cues? How can we get better at the contactless stuff you were talking about, automating the process right down to where you pick up your bag? What are your thoughts on that? Well, one of the challenges here is that the air transport industry has turned the Scud missile launcher around and, and you know, aimed it at its feet for the last nine months. Uh, the sector knew what was going on from the start and it could see what was happening in China from January. And instead of having a coordinated response, the experience is different in every airport you go to, on every airline, on every transport provider that takes you to the airport, at every hotel. And, and that hasn't helped confidence. They haven't had consistent standards and processes and it's still the case. You know, whether it's testing on arrival Dubai launched a 10 minute test very early on. Others are still saying, oh, we don't know whether we can do testing. And I think that erodes confidence again, because people don't know. The story about um, infections on planes, you hear such different views. Uh, this week, I've been hearing that 
the single biggest place in which you get uh, infections in, in terms of the number of people versus the number of infections is in an aircraft cabin. So the, it's very confusing. For airports themselves, uh, there are some interesting challenges. Hmm. And one is how do you eliminate all of the touch surfaces? How do you eliminate anything where you're putting your hand on it or you're handing something to another human and they're handing it back to you? And so Bangalore Airport was the first. In January, they could see what was going on in China and they created a project to create touchless experiences from curb to cabin. And they literally in 60 days have now got put in place a system where you never have to touch anything, you never have to hand anything over. Everything is done with biometrics, with scanning of documents that you do yourself. So it's entirely self-service. And the sector knows it has to go that way. That one of the challenges is the cost of this. Well over 50% of airports before this crisis were losing money. Now it's pretty much all of them. I, I can't think of any airports, any major airports outside China that aren't making a loss. Mm. Inside China, I think some are breaking even, but you know, you, you'd have to push back a little bit on those numbers to truly understand them. And that's, I think, part of the challenge, the cost of creating these experiences, the cost of maintaining a COVID secure environment is a real challenge. And I think until you get to vaccination certificates, which is where Qantas are going, it, it's always going to be a difficult experience. So I think, you know, if we're talking near term, then it's just a rough outlook. I think there's, there's not a lot the sector can do now to increase the flow of passengers it's outside their control. It doesn't matter what the sector says, you're not going to persuade a corporation to get back to spending one to two million dollars to get its 200 top people meeting in Hawaii or Venezuela or London when they can do that same event over the course of four days for three hours a day from your desktop and the cost drops to about $200,000. It, they're just not going to do it for some time. And they're already baking into their budgets for next year, those cost reductions, those reductions, as Rob says, on business travel. So I, I think the sector is kind of looking for a silver lining in this that just doesn't exist mm. in the near term. What we will see, though, is hopefully the smartest ones will be looking beyond the current pain and recognising that there are some things they can do to get their act together. So transitioning from having all those horrible fixed retail outlets that you know the common thing is most of them are empty and don't sell very much anyway to much more pop-up retail much more frequency of changing who is occupying the outlets secondly it is about driving down the environmental footprint the unintended benefit of the crisis has been that the aviation sector's footprint has dropped quite dramatically in terms of emissions in terms of waste, in terms of energy usage. The sector has to recognise that 2050 is a ridiculous target in terms of getting to zero emissions. We're now seeing cities like Glasgow and Copenhagen talking about zero emissions by 2025. Norway's the first country to set 2030. There's a whole bunch of corporations that's literally growing by the week who are talking about zero emissions by 2030 and ideally getting to zero waste and zero external energy consumption. The, the aviation sector has to get its act together and really accelerate that. And now is the best time to do this when we've got some spare resource, we've got some time to really focus on driving down the footprint. And I think this is where the sector really needs to be brave and think about the longer term and focus on that. Because as I said, there's, there's not a lot it can do to generate more travel right now. What types of innovations has this pandemic, uh, you know, fast tracked for you, Rob? So, for example, you know, humans are pretty dangerous. And in your last episode, it was pre-pandemic and you were talking about pandemic preparedness then, you know, and clearly the world needs to do much more. Is this driving innovation in robotics and other contactless technologies? What are you seeing from where you sit? Yeah, look, I, I, I tend to look at, um, uh, look, Rohit set the scene for actually talking about what are the immediate things that we've actually got to look at with the innovations and then moving through to say some of the longer term ones, which uh, will come through. 
So um, some of the immediate things we've seen is uh, people have been forced and pushed into the idea of actually having um, or using digital as a way of one, interacting with your family, loved ones, business, um, and even conducting studies, and even in fact doing a lot of service and service delivery. So that we've, we've seen this um, remarkable pivot, although we've been doing these things for many, many years. It's just that the whole population shifted in that sort of angle. So behind all of that is a lot of innovation in, in fact, how to make this work in a safe and secure manner. Um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the innovation to come through that you can have, say, uh, a Zoom chat with your whole family members and you can just sort of partition off and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation while others are going on. Um, I'm sure that that piece of technology has been worked on because that will be worth a fortune. Uh, you imagine it, you know, the malaise that you actually have with your families on Zoom at the moment, so competing conversations. Now, picking up on the idea about who's fit to travel and who's safe to travel, the whole area of doing uh, point of service testing, which at the beginning of this, we didn't know how to test for this virus because we didn't have any for it. Uh, it's now looking at the validity and the stratification. And in Australia, we've been given a bit of a breather with regards to this um, pandemic. So we have got the luxury of looking at, well, what would it look like if you arrived here and who would actually have to be quarantined and who would have free passage? What does it mean if you've had an immunisation and, uh, and where, what sort of risk have you got? Who needs to stay for how long in what sort of place? So those sorts of questions are, are where the innovation is coming from that we will have amazing uh, test technology in the short term as that moves through. The idea of vaccination, we've seen one of the fastest turnarounds for the development of new therapeutics that we've ever seen in our history. And that's come from global collaboration, which I hope continues after this pandemic because we've been working across corporations, governments, countries, science authorities and consumers and, and, and providers, never seen this before in healthcare um, to such a degree. And if we can actually hold on to that type of thing, we may in fact find great advances in other areas of healthcare with that cooperation. Thinking about passage, uh, there are precedences, there are yellow fever tickets that you have to have when you're traveling. There have been cholera and typhoid in the past and certainly smallpox. So I have no problem with the idea of actually um, a, a, a sort of a WHO sanctioned authority, I have been immunized by this vaccine, therefore um, uh, allowing you some sort of rite of passage. That will rely on itself out over the next 12 months, which will free things up a little in that perspective. Now let's just fast forward to the way that we actually do business and conduct ourselves. So digital is just one of those formats. The other part is the, um, the AI machine learning in the background that will actually allow us to do these. Um, types of um, you know, transactions and business uh, development and also the way that we will in fact actually be able to work. I think that that's going to be accelerated as a way of um, providing platforms for us to work in itself. Um, even go further forward, uh, we're not, we haven't stopped on um, innovation outside of COVID, thank goodness, because it's the stuff that keeps me sane at the moment. So we're working of, with NASA and the European Space Agency on uh, prolonged space travel. Now, what's that got to do with travel? Well, we are going to see space tourism um, and uh, certainly that will uh, pick up. But more importantly, we're going to see the use of some of that technology to allow us to, say, go from Melbourne to London in a couple of hours. Um, that technology is tantalisingly closer than we think but we still have to deal with the human challenges of in fact actually allowing people or enabling people to actually do this type of travel as it stands. So uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on here and uh, I'm really pleased to say that we're still actually working on some of those, Mike, rather than just being completely consumed by COVID at this stage. Yeah, great. And I reckon we should come back to that idea of hypersonic flight. But Rohit, I, wanted, I could see you were thinking about how business is changing and how we conduct ourselves. And you were talking about business meetings and, you know, baking in the savings from, you know, not having to meet in person anymore. How immersive is, you know, our, you know, Zooms of the future going to become? Like, do you see a role for VR technology and, you know, holograms or, you know, where's this going, do you think? Well, all of the immersive technologies are moving at pace and in some regards, they've been accelerated by people saying, okay, if we're going to now have a significant element of virtual in our meetings, in our experiences, then we, we need to make them more multi-sensory in the same way as if you're in the room with someone, there's an energetic transfer, there's a handshake, there's all sorts of things. 
and we, we've experimented with things like touchable holograms, with giving people scents via technology so you can smell things, with uh, the ability to, to stimulate all of your senses. So it, we're not far off being able to, instead of staying in a hotel room, uh, simulating that in your house so that you could literally have digital wallpaper that shows you the view you would have had from the Pan Pacific in Hong Kong to feeling the bed linens in the same way as you would there to having the bathroom smell like that, the, the bathroom there and tasting the food you would have had in the restaurant that sat from here, you know, here in my flat in Golders Green, North London. So we know all that's coming and we can create more of a multi-sensory experience. There's some issues that we haven't quite cracked, which are the, the kind of mental overload that comes from looking at a screen all day long and just trying to interact with people. If you're in a meeting room, you can scan the body language, you can see what's going on, you can have sidebar conversations uh, and you can nip out to the bathroom uh, or when you go for a coffee, you can chat with people. You can't do any of that online. Well, you can nip out to the bathroom, but there's an empty screen there. And it's much harder to, main, to, to deliver the same experience. And that's the thing we're hearing from clients all around the world. Uh, in fact, as soon as I get off this call, I'm, I'm going on to a session with uh, the leadership team of a big pharma organization who are just wrestling with the basic mechanics of how you maintain culture, how you do leadership, how you keep motivation high in an environment where quite often half the team are physical and half are online. So I think we, we, we're still learning to crack that. Technology will help with some of that. Uh, Rob talked about having the sidebar conversations. You can nip off into breakout rooms if you want. It's a little bit clunky right now. And as you say, something where you could literally just tap on the person's image and the two of you disappear into a side room uh, could be, uh, you know, it won't be far off. We yeah. also have to understand that some of the people who've done best in this period uh, are also very high tech companies and it's really accelerated their investments. So if you look at Apple, their valuation has doubled from a trillion dollars to $2 trillion this year, the valuation of Tesla has gone up 500%. They're now worth 600 billion. At the end of the year, when they get included into, I think it's a Fortune 500, automatically all of the tracker industries, all of the, the, the benchmark indices will have to buy Tesla shares. So that will propel them close to a trillion dollar valuation. And, and that gives these companies headroom to go out and buy other players who are doing all of this multi-sensory stuff, who is creating all of these exponentially experiential technologies. So you're going to see a real acceleration of that. I think the other thing we're going to see is that so be, before the pandemic, supply chains were shortening on average by about 50 kilometers a year. Uh, the OECD did a study and said from 2013 to 2019, for the average manufacturer, supply chains were shortening about 50 kilometers a year. This has really accelerated it because countries don't want to be at risk of their air cargo, their shipping being held up in ports around the world. So everyone wants to bring manufacturing closer to home. And that's driving again, another shift in science and technology to create localized production. I can't set up a 50,000 car a year production facility in Iceland when I've only got 350,000 people. But I can create one that produces them using 3D printing and only needs to produce two and a half thousand cars to uh, break even. So we're going to see some quite radical innovation happening simply because of the outcome of the pandemic that shifted our thinking about the way we operate and, and our business model and almost forcing people back to 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 basic and saying, if I was starting this company again, how would I design it from the bottom up? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to pick up on some of those things. So uh, as a public health doc, I'm a scholar of pandemics. So I've looked at um, what happened in the 1300s uh, medieval time. It lifted medieval humankind into the Renaissance. 
one of the most exciting science and artistic periods of humanity ever, never been eclipsed in that setting. The 1600 plague, which went on for 200 plus years, we had Shakespearean type of experiences because he lived through it, um, but we also saw uh, other, other advances in technology and industry that came from that. The Spanish influenza gave us the roaring 20s. And I think Rohit's just sort of starting to tell us what's going to happen here with the revolution that's going to occur after the COVID pandemic. And it's really actually, we change our value systems after this. We have a wake up call. Hey, there's something serious going on and we actually need to consider what do we truly value and where does it fit? Now, let's just... Also, I want to unpack some of the change management issues that are going on. So as a, as a, as a doctor and a GP in Australia, um, I'm actually proficient in telemedicine consults, so particularly I worked in rural areas. So for me, the idea of actually getting some of those nuances, particularly, say, through mental health consults and others from patients, is something that I've developed over my professional career but the rest of the population need to develop that. And we've sort of identified this, we've called this in our workplace at the moment, the absence of small talk. So what we've done in our meetings is there's that part where you can just ham about with regards to the conversations that you'd actually have if you were in the room before you go into the formal meeting, or the idea of actually saying to someone, hey, you know, let's just hang around at the end of this and have a chat about uh, what you're up to and what's going on. Um, we haven't got that right. You know, the change and the disruption is, is, is going to come from behavioural change, the acceptance that this is actually how I do work. So think about, say, telemedicine in a sense of health consults. It's not there's telemedicine and there's virtual, it's I'm given care. And the format that I get that care depends on what's appropriate for that particular time. So the same comes with business. I'm doing business and the format for that business is what's the most appropriate and sort of amenable way. But that's a human factor that needs to actually come into this and it'll be a, a human design and an engineering one. We will get over this because we certainly got over this um, in Australia, for instance, with healthcare delivery to some of the most remote populations on the world. Um, so we do that. Um, so I think in the sense of how to get by through normal life, I can see that just being a step. Uh, but, hey, I want you to think about what's going to come after this one that's going to be exciting because the Roaring Twenties, um, my great aunts and uncles that lived through it said it was just fantastic. So I'm looking forward to what's coming next. I think uh, one of the most interesting uh, areas is uh, around telehealth is, is telesurgery. So right now, if you live in any big city, it's very likely that at least one hospital there will now be using robots in surgery where the, the doctor sits in another room almost and, and controls the robot and, and monitors what it's doing, but the robot does the work. But somewhere between 70 and 80% of the people on the planet don't live within 50 miles of a hospital. Yeah. Uh, and the hospitals locally to many of them don't have these facilities. As we're bringing down the cost and the footprint of this technology, we can distribute this across the planet. You don't need a doctor in, no. in, in the locations you're doing this. What you need is two things. One is you need a good mechanic who can set this thing up and, and knows how to set the kit up. And the other thing is you need a good cleaning company to come in and sterilize it. You don't need healthcare professionals, but suddenly we can do all sorts of operative treatments. Uh, very remotely so that doctor maybe even 3,000 miles away can deliver the same quality of experience but without being there so I think that's all of that kind of stuff what what technology will enable allowing you to give your granny a hug across the other side of the planet for her birthday taste her birthday cake all of that is is going to be fantastic that obviously there's going to be some big dislocations we we know that significant numbers of jobs are going to be replaced. That's been accelerated by the pandemic as companies say, we need to reduce the variability of, of our business activity by automating more of it. So we, we're going to take jobs out. The real challenge here for governments is to make sure we're investing in the retraining of the population to take up the new jobs that will emerge in synthetic biology, in autonomous vehicles, in three printed uh, artifacts in new materials. There's a whole range of incredible trillion dollar industries coming through. Life extension could be the biggest sector in the planet. But if I'm a lawyer today, or if I'm a shop assistant, whose job might be automated out, it doesn't seem like a natural step to go and work as a lab technician 
in a company making therapeutics to extend my life expectancy. So there's a transition required. There's a skills transition. There's an investment in those sectors. So there's a real challenge for government. So as to the next stage of the recovery is about investing in those things to lay the platforms for the future. And this, uh, you know, as Rob said, this kind of next renaissance, this next explosion of possibility. Perhaps the biggest challenge we face is how we maintain our humanity in that period. There's a risk that we end up creating this technocentric uh, dystopia rather than a human centric, something close to utopia. And, and, and I don't think we're paying enough attention to that, to the human factors, to the things that really count, which is you know, connection, empathy, all of those things. And we are seeing some good examples of that. The CEO of one company that we've been researching, and I wish I could remember the name, um, has been uh, deliberately focusing on getting to know the people in the picture. So if your husband walks past you on the screen to, to kind of say hello to them and have a chat or to have a chat to your kids or find out about who your dog is, because if that's where you're working, then to get to know you and your environment reduces the stress for people. And we're having to think really hard about things like the design of work again. We'd got used to just handing Rob more and more tasks. And the better Rob got at doing tasks and the longer Rob worked into the night to get his task done, the more we gave him. Now we're having to think much harder about, well, what is your scope of responsibility? What is the training you have to do those tasks? And how do we make sure we're giving you a manageable workload and in a sense, using the technology to monitor that, whether it's monitoring screen time, monitoring your stress levels, monitoring your oxygen flow, heart rate, but really trying to make sure we're using the tech as well to monitor you to the point where, you know, maybe you are about to have a cardiac arrest. But 30 minutes before that, various bodily indicators have told us you're heading that way. So before we tell you you're having a heart attack, the ambulance is already on the way. Uh, and, and we've already alerted the medical facility and sent them all your information. So we're going to have to use the technology in smarter and smarter ways to enhance human experience. And will that ambulance be driven by a person? You know, you brought up the Tesla before, and I'm really interested to unpack this because we're talking about the future of travel today. What do electric autonomous vehicles mean for us going forward? Uh, Rob, yes. will, will the current car I own be the last car I ever own? So in our, um, our Future of Health uh, report that we brought out before the pandemic, uh, and we actually, you're quite right, we actually did identify that a pandemic was a major risk for us in that report. Um, but the, uh, the issue is uh, with longevity is cognitive decline and also the ability to safely uh, get yourself around. And social isolation is in fact actually the antecedent to many causes of ill health. And what's really exciting in the UK, for instance, they have identified that loneliness is, is something that needs, as a priority needs to be addressed. Um, here in Australia, we're starting to get our government interested in the cost of loneliness um, to our society. Now, that aside, who's lonely? A lot of aged people after they've actually retired, um, unless they've been able to make that transition into meaningful activities, or if disability comes on, be it, say, cognitive decline, um, they can't drive. And so by getting more isolated, things get worse. So uh, in the future of health, we looked at the idea that someone with a moderate cognitive decline should be able to live in a purpose-built house, um, relatively independent, but still with the human touch that comes in and the autonomous vehicle, because that actually allows you to um, have the freedom of uh, still getting out in, and safely getting out. Um, I really don't think that many of us will be physically driving vehicles uh, in, in the uh, not too distant future. Why? Because it's in fact actually much safer. And two, you can in fact move with much greater efficiency once the vehicles are, are all moving on to the autonomous level. So it'll be a staged introduction across our freeways. Um, but also with health applications. And I think in the sense of ambulances and others, um, the human factors in driving a vehicle very fast in, uh, in, in unpredictable settings um, is in fact actually better done by um, machine enhancement with regards to the driving. So we will see um, blends of these things coming through about allowing that to happen so that uh, the ambulance officers, if they're in the vehicle, are able to do what they're actually trying to do, less of driving and more of saving a life. 
Right. The other part is 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 the visit um, uh, in the house and taking the service in, and uh, you know, hence back to the space travel challenge is for protracted and prolonged space travel. As with our Antarctic um, uh, uh, divisions um, out of here from Australia, is the idea of actually providing healthcare where there is no other option. So you can sort of see where our logic's going here, Mike, in the sense of what um, what will healthcare look like and how will we travel around. Uh, I think, yes, autonomous is definitely going to happen and it's going to happen faster than we think. So are you on the same page here, Rohit, around the autonomous vehicles that are definitely on the near rather than far horizon? Well, it's been accelerated. So if you look, China's put something or committed $430 billion to uh, autonomy and uh, or to AI and, and a big part of that is autonomy. All of the manufacturers are working on autonomy. Uh, what we've just seen is Uber were working on autonomy and instead they've partnered with another company now. They've effectively sold their autonomous unit to it because they're, they're making greater progress and they're pouring 400 million US dollars in to, to support that. And, and I think everyone is gonna do that. The, 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 the issue with autonomy is not so much the technology, we're, we're learning more and more about how to have the car learn for itself about the environment it's in and how to do uh, the kind of infrastructure that we need. In cities, it's great. In big towns, it's great. You can create that. It's when you get out into rural areas that you don't have the knowledge about the roads and everything to guide that. So what you need is cars to pick up that information, share it so you can learn from other vehicles. We're getting there. The other thing is the kind of ethical, moral, and legal framework around this that says, okay, if you are going to have an accident, who do you hit? Mm. Uh, and what basis do we do that? Do we base this on your, your value to society morally? So if you're an 80-year-old clergyman, we think that you're really valuable. Or do we do it on your, 18, you know, your economic value, in which case the 18-year-old you know, whiz kid who could invent the next technology might get prioritized, then we're quite happy taking the, the 80 year old clergyman. Uh, we, we need that kind of ethical, moral uh, framework and it's gonna differ around the world. So suddenly we're having to think about issues that we haven't thought about before. We've left that to you to decide and make that assessment. If, if there's a choice of three people I'm gonna hit, you know, when it comes to you know, something going wrong, uh, swerving another car, then you make that choice almost subconsciously. But we're going to have to create frameworks around all this. So autonomy is going to be great. And autonomy in all sorts of contexts, I think, is going to be great. Like your, your autonomous cooking facilities in your kitchen, where you can download personalized recipes created by the robot of your favorite chef, mm -hmm. where the utensils cook to the same standard as that chef would have done, all done autonomously, even down to the cleaning. And again, these feel like science fiction. But we're right on the cusp of all this stuff now. We're, we're there. It's about adoption by society and about um, us kind of being able to do that at a price point that makes it a mass accessible service. I just want to pick up on one issue around aging. So we, we kind of acknowledge that the group that's been most affected by this current pandemic are older people. Largely all around the world, it's been the same. And we've, we've closed down economies in order to protect them and the health service. Now people are beginning to realize that if we reframe aging, not as a natural condition, but potentially as a disease that can be cured, then we can dramatically change the, you know, the way things are dealt with in the future. This pandemic is estimated to have cost $28 trillion in lost productivity and somewhere between eight and $16 trillion to actually deal with it directly. So if we can bring that down, even by a couple of trillion dollars, by helping to extend people's healthy lifespans, improve their resilience, then we completely change the way we deal with future pandemics or future health crises. So that's why you're seeing so much money being poured into life extension therapies. Forget all the cryogenic freezing stuff. I mean, that's kind of at the wacky end of this. But all the other stuff, the therapeutics, uh, the pharmaceuticals, the, the, the lifestyle regimes that could extend your, your life uh, by 5, 10, 20, even 50 years, 
not only make you more disease resistant and more, you know, improve your body's capacity to, to fight off things like pandemics, but also extend your working, you know, you know, your potential working life. So I think countries are increasingly going to start acknowledging aging as something you can work on uh, and something that becomes almost an economic priority to do so. Rohit, you said the magic words, science fiction, so let's get ridiculous. You know, when I think about the future of travel, you know, I think about stuff like, you know, the autonomous vehicle in the original Total Recall, Johnny Cab, which gets taken out by Arnie at some point, I think. Then there was a later Total Recall that had like the fall, it was like this sort of thing, elevator that went right through the core of the earth in about five minutes. Uh, you know, you got Back to the Future 2 and, you know, the fifth element flying cars. And Rob, you already opened us up to some, you know, some far horizon stuff, you know, or maybe not so far in terms of uh, space tourism and hypersonic flight. Let's unpack that a bit more. Where do you guys get your inspiration from? Is there anything in sci-fi that, you know, is going to come to pass in your opinion? Well, I've focused a lot on uh, dystopian horror, really. I mean, the uh, film Contagion, which... Uh, is probably the most well-written pandemic film uh, because it was written by public health specialists uh, or at least they had a solid advisor. Now, the difference between that and this one is uh, that that disease had a 40% fatality rate, which is far worse than the one we've got at the moment. Um, but looking at the way that the recovery comes through out of states of disorder, which is uh, where we go through. I, I've been, I watched uh, until it uh, started to irritate me with the Brave New World uh, remake. And I, I'm thinking that was written in 1933 or something like that. Unbelievable when you start to look at the concepts that were coming through there about where it is. We haven't made it to where that is, but there's a lot of things, there's a lot of material in, uh, in something like that uh, for us to actually look at and, and balance where we are. Um, I guess, I guess, in the one sense, I, I do want to peg back to to, to travel. What actually drives me about uh, travel and where it is, and I do um, uh, sort of pick up on Elaine Bertans, um the uh, the philosophy of travel that he actually wrote, or the art of travel, as he wrote in that book. And there's the three segments: the person who likes to plan, the person who likes the journey, and the person who likes the destination. And um, and in one sense, uh, those are the sort of the segments that I start to look at as to, well, what would the future look like in, in, in how we might travel? Because you're really catering for those. Uh, planning, yeah, that's great. But I like the journey and I like the way the journey actually takes you where you didn't think you were going to go. I like the unexpected. I like to actually suddenly find myself in a street store or being adopted by a family in a, in a, in a developing country and, and getting a really total experience or, you know, for instance, learning how to play the gamelan in, uh, in Bali or, for that matter, making silage in rural France um, with a lovely evening in the Loire Valley. Um, you know, these are things that uh, that's what I like with travel. A lot of people like the destination. I have to climb Mount Everest. If I don't climb Mount Everest, I haven't been there. You know, if I don't, in fact, actually go to all the art galleries of Paris, I haven't been there. You know, that sort of destination focus. So, so when we think about it, that's the human factor that's going to muddy what we talk about with where we're going to go with how you're going to travel. So the virtual travel experience is possible for destination seekers. Um, for people like myself, no, unless you, in fact, actually have random randomness come into the program and, in fact, flip me somewhere else and take me onto something that I wasn't expecting and it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, that could be coped with. The planner, the meticulous planner, yeah, well, they're probably going to thrive into the, into the future. So travel projections, I, I, I tend to like to think about it in the way that, uh, you know, lumping people into those areas. But the inspiration of, uh, we don't need a lot of pushing to get inspiration for what's going to happen with travel. You know, I'm of the age where the, the lunar landing uh, just burnt an indelible mark in me because I was seven years old and they landed on the moon. And that's just, just you know, as a seven-year-old, I could have told you where the Sea of Tranquility was with 100% accuracy, um, Mike, by pointing at it on the moon model. Um, now, now, where we look at the space travel business, the idea of actually having the excitement of going into just you know sub-atmospheric uh, sort of uh, levels or super atmospheric levels and just going in that plane flight and shooting straight across or around the globe and landing somewhere else um, exorbitantly expensive and probably an amazing luxury I think in one sense but on the other side of it the inspiration's already in front of us by actual living science fiction that's going on I think that's the that's the sort of part I, I, I have scientists around me uh, that are, that are in fact thinking of the impossible every single day and and I think wow um, how do we make that happen 
Um, so I know I've twisted your, um, your question around back to you. Um, I'm sort of saying that there are a lot of things around us now that are actually uh, driving this, uh, this quest for change and, uh, and excitement. Yeah, Rohit, over to you. What do you think? And I also want to know your opinion on Elon Musk. Like, is this a visionary? You know, should we be celebrating these big ideas, Hyperloop and, you know, what he's trying to do with Tesla? Or, you know, you know, is this helpful, these types of big thinking? It depends on who you are again. I think most people would celebrate truly clean technologies that don't do more infrastructure damage. So I, I think Hyperloop, for example, where you're not drilling into the ground and you can hopefully deliver a Hyperloop infrastructure for a fraction of the cost of trains or you know, um, relaying road surfaces and things, then yeah, I think th those are incredibly powerful. They're also almost zero environmental footprint. So they're great. They bring down the cost to almost zero. So it's a, there's an exponential benefit in all sorts of regards. The, you know, the space elevator is probably 50 to 100 years off, but, you know, where you could travel from here to the moon on an elevator, madness. But, you know, people in Japan are working on it. As Rob says, almost anything you can think of that's outside our current frame of reference has been talked about by a science fiction writer, but also is probably being worked on by scientists somewhere or visionaries somewhere. Uh, and so if you think about colonies beneath the sea, Dubai tried to build the undersea hotel. Now, it didn't happen, but a lot of work was done on that. And we will see more colonizing other planets. We're not going to get McAlpines or Wimpy or whoever going out and building these things in the same way with 2000 laborers trying to construct a, a, a habitat on Mars. But with robots, we can do that. So we can send robots up to do that construction. But we won't be flying out 50,000 robots. We'll be sending out 20 replicator robots that will then replicate themselves when they get there to generate thousands of these things. And they'll go from being you know, the equivalent of a bricklayer to a glazier to a plumber to an electrician during the course of their existence rather than having to fly different ones out there. So the technology will take us to incredible places. But bringing it back to the sheer travel experience, then with multi-sensory experiences, we'll be able to experience, you know, sitting in the Loire Valley one evening, sipping wine, having the smells and the, the, the feel of the wind in your face, the sights you're seeing but also the emotional experience. That's what's missing today with a lot of video. But if I, you know, I'm never going to get to the Galapagos probably, but if I can capture the experience of someone who goes there and not only are the, the physical experience, but the emotional experience, that changes what I'm consuming via virtual reality. So you could have a situation where you send certain people on these trips and they're co-funded by the airline the hotel groups and everyone else who was involved. And then they resell your experience to people around the world to consume via VR. So suddenly you make your money in a very different way. And that, you know, we start to open up to new business models that are created by these new experiences. And I think we really are in that place now where if you can envisage it, if you can dream it, we'll probably be able to create it at some point. We may not yet have the science or technology to do that. So one of the things about artificial intelligence is it's moving fast, but it's still not as smart as humans in every aspect of human thought. But we will, within five to 10 years, have artificial general intelligence that's as smart as humans 80% of the time for 80% of what we do. We'll then get to artificial general intelligence, I believe, not, not long after that. But the really interesting one is then when you go beyond that to super intelligence, where we start to have AI that's smarter than humans and mm. start to invent new science, starts to invent totally new ways of solving problems like environmental damage, uh, like climate change, like food generation and distribution to eliminate hunger. And, and that's the really interesting bit to me is what will this... Uh, so what will this advanced technology create that we can't even imagine? 
And then the other thing is that might allow us to connect in meaningful ways to intelligences on other planets, which I believe they have to exist in, in, in all the universes out there. Uh, and maybe they're on the planet now. Apparently, you know, the latest one I've heard is that, that someone in Israel has said that there's, AI, there's a, um, aliens on our planet and Trump knows about it. And uh, maybe he's waiting for them to step in and fix the election. But, you know, at some point we might connect with intelligences on another planet uh, and, and they might have technologies that we couldn't imagine. Star Trek did a pretty good job of that, actually. It kind of really expanded our thinking about what that might look like. And a lot of science fiction writers have gone there. But again, they're bounded by their experience, by the limits of what they can see or imagine. But when we start to get confronted by what's way beyond our imagination, what would be created by entities that live and, and exist in a totally different way that starts to become truly mind-blowing wow yeah. you've both taken us to such far horizons there it's fantastic and we're approaching the end of our journey gentlemen but i i want to finish up and ask you both what the future of travel looks like from what you've just said there i think the way that we travel today will seem very very antiquated and possibly in the not too distant future uh, over to you rob what's the future of travel look like for you well, 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 again, I think it actually comes back to what uh, you personally want and have been socialised. So at the moment, we've been socialised with a particular model of travel. And through a disruptive change period, such as a pandemic, we are being uh, told to address uh, what do we value about what we actually do with our lives and how that's experienced. So what may be a great travel experience for you is not necessarily one for me. So I think the idea of the, the personalization of how that fits in. So, so where are we going to go? And I think the idea of augmented um, experiences uh, and, and ways of in fact doing this so that we actually respect the planet that we live on um, and, and, and other cultures and others in a much more meaningful way to allow that. And for people who do want those you know, form type of tourism experiences, so much of that would easily be turned into a virtual experience that would probably be just as, uh, just as enjoyable for people who are seeking that. So again, like I said to you, it's really what the individual um, would, would, uh, would be interested in and how that would go. The idea of, in fact, actually uh, movement of people around to the levels that we've seen in the past, I think it's going to take a long time before we can actually do that because that's confidence. And again, that's a human factor, which is the one thing that um, is always the uh, issue that actually uh, challenges us when we're looking at change and technological um, uh, impact. So we have to actually deal with that. So let me give you a kind of futuristic vision and you can put your own time frame on this. Imagine you're sat at home. I'm, I'm watching a film about Japan. I get very excited about the possibility of going there. My AI and all the bodily worn sensors plus the TV looking at my face, monitoring my microfacial expressions together, they work out that this sense set of emotions uh, and sensations mean that I'm really excited. I'd like to go and visit there. By the time the film ends, the AI has created a little 60 second travelogue of what I might see if I went to Japan and highlights I might enjoy. I buy into that. I share it with friends via my AI, see who wants to come with me. The AI then takes everyone's requirements, turns it into a request for proposals, puts it out on the web. All the suppliers come back and bid for what experience they can create. The AI then negotiates the best price for the best deal come to the day of travel i don't need any luggage because i'm going to have it all 3d printed for me waiting on arrival uh the car picks me up it's an autonomous vehicle in the car all the security checks all the scans everything is done on the way to the airport so i just arrive by the side of the plane walk onto the plane on the flight the ai is negotiate with the airline to make sure i only get the food and, and drink that's good for me uh, and then I can choose where, what I want to happen to me in that 10 hour travel experience. So I might just choose to dream and dream various dreams that are induced for me about Japan and its history. During that, I might also want to have downloaded to my memory the Japanese language so I can talk to people when I get there. On arrival, I'm taken straight to my hotel by the autonomous vehicle. I check in with my face. I open the door with my face with facial recognition. The walls are covered with digital wallpaper so I can have on them whatever I want to see. As I mentioned, the minibar is full of whatever I want. 
as I travel around the island, I'm, I either know Japanese now, so I can talk to people directly, or my AI is doing instant translation. Anything I want to buy, I simply pay for by, by blinking my eyes. A drone picks that stuff up, takes it back to my hotel. I don't see it again till I get home, unless I want it while I'm there. Uh, and the, uh, when I come back, uh, on the flight back, I've decided to fly hypersonic, so I do it in about four hours. And on that journey home, my AI takes me through the balance sheet for my experience because I've had every aspect of it tracked, uh, monitored, and turned into VR experiences for people around the world. And it tells me that I've actually made a profit on my journey because of the number of people who've bought, bought it. That's a vision of what travel could become. Good rear throw hit, like it. It's great. I want to travel with you, Robert. Yeah, let's hope that's on the near horizon. I love that. Some would hate it. And I, I totally get that. But, but that's where if you combine all these innovations together, you can reinvent the travel experience. You create new business models. You create new categories of travel. So there's the physical one. And then there's the experiential one where I don't have to leave my front room to have all these experiences. And I think... Again, for some people, this is, is utopia. For others, it's a, it's a dystopian hell. So I think we, we have to recognize there isn't one future travel. There are multiple versions of it. Good job, Rohit. On that note, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me, Rohit. Rob, bon voyage, safe travels. Thanks for joining me on Future as well. That's a wrap for the future of travel. Uh, as always, please uh, like, share, follow, subscribe, and stay tuned at futurist.world. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rohit. Take care and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.